I want to just talk to you for a minute about the appeal that we've just put out in the last week or so regarding radiators for the Ukraine. I'm actually coming to you from Mars Hill right now. Behind me is the Acropolis. And as I move around to my right, your left, you're going to see Athens in the background. And this is the place where the Apostle Paul 2000 years ago, he came and stood on this spot here on Mars Hill. And he spoke a message that was culturally relevant to the generation, generation of today. He said, hey, man of Athens, Athens, I want to speak to you about an altar that I've seen to an unknown God. And what he did is he made the gospel of Jesus Christ relevant to the generation that he was speaking to. And I think what we have an opportunity to do with, through kindness in our giving into the Ukraine right now is actually make the gospel of Jesus Christ relevant to people who are hurting right now. The issue that we have in Kharkiv in the Ukraine is that winter is fast approaching. And with winter approaching, we know that people don't have heating in order to stay warm and also um, dry their clothes from washing, etc. Many windows smashed in the apartments from the daily bombing that is still happening even as I record this right now. And we have an opportunity just through our kindness, through the generosity of our hearts, to to help people warm their houses and stay alive this terrible winter season that the Ukraine is about to go into. Radiators cost around 80 pounds each. We're trying to work out on other deals as well. The need is huge at the moment. Pastor Valeri has asked if we can help him to somehow find up to 10,000 radiators at 80, 80 pounds each, which is obviously an incredible price. We have already been able to fund a thousand radiators, but the need is great. So we're asking you to stand with us in Assemblies of God and bring a, a, a gospel of love to a generation in the Ukraine right now to make the gospel relevant, just as Paul did on this hill, Mars Hill, 2,000 years ago. 80 pounds per radiator. 80 pounds will warm and keep a family alive this winter in the Ukraine. Please stand with us in giving today as a church family. Thank you so much. I think I might be wired for sound now. So. Um, a few problems there with the sound, but you got the general message. Great. And mine's back on as well. Oh, we're online as well. Excellent. Oh well, is anybody left watching, I wonder? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can tell them to watch it later and fast forward to, um, what, 35 minutes in. <laughs> what a morning, eh? <laughs> but God is good, God is good. Do you know what? When I first heard that, I thought, can we dare to raise enough money for five radiators? Can we manage as a church? to get 400 pounds. We've already got enough for 35. Isn't that incredible? Thanks to so many people, people in our community, people in our church who weren't able to come this week, and people at New Life Church in Castle Douglas who took up an offering themselves and brought it down here. I was sitting in here on Thursday morning. I don't think I've ever been handed such a big watch of 20 and 10 pound notes. Isn't that wonderful? Praise God. So, it's Advent Sunday today. Advent from the Latin for coming. Traditionally, the time to start preparing to celebrate the birth of Jesus. But also a reminder of the need to prepare for his second coming. Have you got an advent calendar yet? <laughs> when I was a child, they always had a nativity scene. And the pictures behind the doors were relevant to celebrating Christ's birth. Do we have a picture here? Oh, yes. Good, good. Nowadays, everyone's <coughs> at it. From chocolate, cosmetics and candle makers to Lego. And goodness knows who else. They've lost the plot. And despite the commercial opportunities, they've miscalculated what Advent is all about. Just like our church countdown devised by Micah was designed to help our online members prepare for worship, countdowns are useful. And if we get our calculations right, they enable us to be ready 
at the right time. How good are you at waiting? Do you make good use of the time to get ready? Or are you more of a last minute person? A week or two ago, Tesco online slots for Christmas were released at 6 a.m. I'd seen the publicity and I was ready, but imagine my surprise when within what seemed like a split second, there were already over 300,000 people ahead of me in the queue. And I was told I had over an hour to wait. No problem. I knew there'd be plenty of slots and I had plenty of other things to do while I waited, but I still had to be ready when my turn came up. Did I have time for my usual quiet time to sort out the fire or have a shower? Imagine miscalculating and missing my slot. <laughs> I would have been in trouble. Yeah. By the one who slumbered on, I hasten to add. <laughs> Back in August, there was great excitement as NASA prepared to launch Artemis, and the countdown had been going for quite some time, but then, after all the build-up, the launch was scrubbed on the 29th of August, only a short while before the planned liftoff. There'd been a miscalculation, and the temperature of one of the engines was running too high. It was rescheduled for a few days later, but scrubbed again, and eventually didn't take off until the 16th of November. It was around 300 years after the birth of Jesus that the church Christianized a number of ancient pagan and midwinter traditions and gave them new Christian significance. But if we look at how so much of the world celebrates Advent and Christmas now, it looks like they've badly miscalculated because the pagan and commercial trappings are far more conspicuous than any Christian significance. Look at this picture. How much evidence do you see in all these Christmassy things of Christ and the biblical account of his birth? Not sure how well you can see that with the sun shining in this morning, but let's not complain. Most of these things are harmless fun, by the way, and in their own way, they help to keep the Christmas season special. Many families have their own traditions too, which keeps the Christmas season special for them. The problem is one of perspective. The birth of Jesus has mostly been crowded out by the world's traditions. And that means people are missing out on Jesus and his incredible, indescribable free gift of salvation. Because people's Christmas plans frequently make no room whatsoever for Jesus, they miscalculate and they peak too soon. And by the time Christmas Day arrives, they're tired of it too busy, too exhausted, or both, to be even bothered with Jesus, let alone seeking his presence and coming together to adore and worship him. There's still no room left at the end. Others have totally miscalculated because they were never really interested in the first place. And when their fantasy Christmas bubble finally bursts, they just coast aimlessly through that idle post-Christmas period to New Year and onward to the January blues. An existence so far removed from our joyful celebration of the Saviour's birth and his abiding presence and the Christmas hope with which we look forward to the year ahead. Miscalculated countdowns to Jesus' birth are nothing new. In the book of Daniel, God revealed things which many have tried to interpret as an exact 
mathematical countdown to the birth, death and second coming of Jesus, the Messiah. The religious authorities knew this and they taught about it. But in Matthew 2, we read that when wise men from the east came to Jerusalem seeking him, no one else was ready. No one. The word used to describe them, Magi, is the same word used 14 times in the book of Daniel. They were almost certainly from Persia where Daniel had received his prophecies and all those years later they did in fact calculate the correct time and they followed the star first to Jerusalem and then on to Bethlehem. It wasn't just Daniel and in the next few weeks we'll be looking at some of Isaiah's messianic prophecies too. You see, God had the best Christmas plans of all. He'd even provided a countdown to the advent or coming of the long-awaited Messiah. But the Jewish religious authorities miscalculated and most of them missed it. Apart from a motley bunch of shepherds and two elderly servants of God in the temple in Jerusalem, nobody else even noticed. Because none of the religious establishment or ruling classes even knew that he'd been born, let alone where he could be found. But the Magi knew. Somehow their knowledge of God's word and their faith had combined so decisively that they followed that star and even came bearing gifts, ready to worship the newborn king. And we know because later on in his own teaching, Jesus confirmed that God their calculations exactly right by identifying himself several times with the words and the imagery of Daniel's visions. And that's why we can look forward with eager anticipation too to his return. And as well as helping us prepare for Christmas, Advent is a time when the church focuses on Jesus' promised return. This time the Bible doesn't provide a mathematical countdown. But Jesus did speak of various signs which we should be aware of. And although there have been some who have tried to read the signs and calculate the exact date of his return, they will almost certainly miscalculate. Because even Jesus said he didn't know the date and the time. He knew the signs though. And we know that so many of the signs we have witnessed in the last few years are consistent with the signs Jesus predicted. And we know that he told us to be ready. Are you ready? Because ready or not, he will return. There are a few countdowns going on in our family at the moment. Like our daughter-in-law and son who are expecting their first child before Christmas, our eighth grandchild. Will he arrive on time? Or will he keep them waiting? We have no idea. But what we do know is that they're ready. All the preparations have been made. Even a bag ready to take along to the hospital on the day he decides to make his appearance. And then next year, we have two weddings. A nephew and a niece. And judging from the wedding websites and the updates from my mom and sister, the ladies of the family at least are making good use of the countdown, all determined to look their best on the two big days. At least we know the dates, because it wasn't always like that. In New Testament Galilee, weddings were arranged by the families of the bride and groom. The people in each village were too closely related to one another, so they arranged for their sons to marry a girl from the next village. Once agreement was reached and toasted with a glass of wine, that was them engaged. But before they could marry, the son was expected to prepare a place for them to live, usually an extension to his father's house. 
No date was fixed for the wedding. It just happened when the home was ready. So the bride-to-be just had to patiently wait, but remain ready in case her groom came for her. No, mo no, no mobiles or WhatsApp in those days. The bride would select her bridesmaids, who would be expected to be ready too, day or night, as would the other invited guests because they didn't know just when the groom would come for his bride. When the new home was ready, the groom would travel to his bride's village, accompanied by his best man, who would sound a trumpet to announce his arrival. Those who were ready would follow them back to the groom's village and were admitted to the function because they were with the groom. If they were wise, before they went to bed, they would make sure they had everything ready, just like my daughter-in-law, before they settled for the night, just in case. Weddings were a source of excitement, and the whole village was expected to be ready to follow the wedding party back to the groom's village, where there would be an amazing feast. Nobody dared miscalculate this, because if they weren't with the groom, they would miss the big day. I'm going to ask Helena to come and read something about that. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom. Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. <coughs> Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Thank you, Helen. Thank you for that. Some people find it stressful enough preparing for a wedding when they do know the date. So just imagine the anxiety of not knowing. In the case of this parable, it looks like they may have seen the signs that the groom might be on his way that night. So you would surely have expected that they would all be ready, wouldn't you? It was pitch dark outside. No street lighting in those days, but only half the bridesmaids had sufficient oil. The five foolish bridesmaids had to go hunting for oil. And while they were doing so, the wedding party headed off to the groom's village. Then, as was the custom, the doors to the function were closed behind them. It was too late for those five foolish bridesmaids. Have you ever arrived late for a wedding? Perhaps you had difficulty finding the church or the hotel for the reception, or your taxi took you to the wrong place. I heard of one couple who managed to get to the venue with the help of Google Maps. They went in and enjoyed a welcoming drink, popped, in, popped their gift in a pile just inside the door, and were soon tucking into canapes. 
But bit by bit, they realised that they didn't recognise any of the other guests. Not one. So they asked somebody whose wedding it was, and it was there that they discovered their miscalculation. The venue was part of a chain, and that they'd gone to the wrong place. So they retrieved their gift, and they headed off, and eventually they found the right wedding. Jesus clearly had something much more important in mind than Google Maps. God's big plan. If we arrive at the wrong wedding venue, we just end up a bit red-faced. We might miss the meal or the first dance, but that's all. But Jesus told this story to his disciples just a matter of a few days before he would be crucified. In a couple of days, he'd be sharing the Last Supper with them and telling them of things that they needed to be ready for. He would be arrested, tried and crucified in a little more than a day or two. Before he left, he broke bread and passed a cup of wine around his disciples and told them this was the means by which they should remember him. The New Testament refers to the church as the bride of Christ. He was a faithful groom, even in death, dying for his beloved bride. At the Last Supper, he spoke of one day drinking wine, new, with his disciples in the kingdom of God. He also told them that he was going to prepare a place for them and would come back for them. Are you seeing how this all fits with the parable and its background. It gets even better because in 1 Thessalonians 4.16 we're told that the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Yes, Jesus has gone to his father's house to prepare a place for his bride, the church. Each of us who can call him Lord and Saviour, and when he's ready, he will return. The trumpet will sound, and we, his bride, the church, will follow. But are we ready? Are we ready? Last week, as we ended our series on Psalms, we noticed again the two roads, one that leads to life and the one that leads to death. And we saw how very important it is to choose the right road. Only Jesus, our heavenly bridegroom, knows the way. So we have to follow him if we want to join him in the greatest wedding function that we are ever going to experience. And if we're going to do that, we must be sure to be ready. That's what this season of Advent is really about. It's about being ready when Jesus comes back for his church, his bride. Surely that's something that none of us wants to miscalculate. No one knows, not even Jesus, when that day will be. If we knew the day, we would certainly make sure we were ready, wouldn't we? Some think they can put it off. Make hay while the sun shines and wait until later in their lives to put the house in order. But oh dear, what would happen if they miscalculated that? This is a decision no one can afford to delay. But when Jesus calls us as his disciples, he warns us that it won't necessarily be an easy road and that he's looking for people who are in it for the long haul. People willing to faithfully devote their lives to his service, living a life of continuous hope and anticipation of his eventual return. Many Christians, including me, think that could be soon. Because the pattern of history and the signs of the times certainly seem consistent with the signs Jesus described. But let's not forget how badly the religious people of ancient Israel 
miscalculated and totally missed their Messiah's birth. Not only that, they refused to recognize his ministry. They made false accusations against him and they crucified him. What about us? What about you? Are you ready? And I don't mean, are you ready for Christmas? Are you really, really ready? Do you have enough oil in your lamp to follow Jesus when he returns for his church? The lamps in a parable, by the way, represent God's word, the truth. As the Bible says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. The oil represents the power of the Holy Spirit and is a symbol of our faith in the one who equips us with power from on high. That's what keeps our lamps burning and ready as his truth continues to shine in and through us. It was a combination of word and faith that enabled the Magi to get their calculations right. This December, in among all the talk of getting ready for the big day, whatever that means to different people, you will find that they will often know enough of the story of Jesus to know about him as a baby in a manger, or Mary and Joseph, the angel Gabriel, shepherds, and angels singing. But they've been crowded out, like in that picture we saw. The Magi had much more than vague knowledge of the Word of God. They had faith. And that faith was strong enough to prompt them into action, to follow the star that led to Jesus. Faith, the confidence in what we hope for, and assurance about what we do not see. Do you have that kind of faith, hope and assurance? Are you ready? What does it mean to be ready? It means simply loving him and loving others in his name and serving him however he called you and equipped you to serve. And today, that includes giving generously to bless the people of Ukraine this Christmas. If, when Jesus returns, he finds us faithfully getting on with our assigned roles and tasks, all will be well. He can return as soon as God is ready, and all will be well. We will be ready, no risk of any miscalculation. Shall we pray? Oh, Father God, Father God, we just thank you. We praise you. We thank you that you had this amazing plan for the salvation of, your, of the world, the salvation of all humanity. You want everyone to be saved, Lord. You call us to share your love for others. Help us, Father, not to crowd you out this Christmas. Help us to find the time to focus on you. And help us, Father God, to be light to the world put our lights up on the lampstands that the whole world would see something of your love that more and more would want to come this Christmas to simply adore you oh come let us adore him Christ the Lord Amen Thank you, Ernie. Um, folks at home, I hope you heard that. I'm sorry about the problems earlier, but um, hopefully you were able to join in with that. We can join in with our last song.
Well, we want to see God's kingdom right here on earth, don't we? We want to, as we celebrate Christmas and we think of the coming from the start, we want to celebrate right here on earth. Let's stand and sing together. Um, sing and build his kingdom right here. Let's stand. time on 
and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Praise the Lord. Let's say the grace together. May the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.